Welcome to Uncomfortable Is Okay, where we explore the science, the stories, and the strategies of getting out of your comfort zone, navigating challenge, and doing the hard things that make life worth living. I'm your host, Chris Desmond. Uncomfortable Is Okay is brought to you by Health Mentors. Health Mentors is a performance well-being company that helps change makers dial in their health and improve their performance in the middle of a chaotic world. We offer one-on-one health mentoring services, as well as a range of workshops and workplace solutions, all the way up to supporting organizations with their well-being strategy. You can find out more at healthmentors.nz or get in contact with Chris at healthmentors.nz. Just a quick note before we start today, this episode was recorded with Dr. David Keane back in 2020, so contextually we're just in, well we've been in lockdown for a little while here in New Zealand, uh, it was originally recorded for another show that I was doing at the time called Leading Through Challenge, so the focus is around leadership, but I think a lot of the lessons and a lot of the things that we talk about here are applicable to ourselves as individuals um, they're great from a leadership perspective and while contextually the stuff we're talking about was happening in 2020 i think again the concepts are really applicable for us today as well so that's why i wanted to to release this out as one of the uncomfortable is okay podcasts but uh, just a heads up that that's where this episode has come from enjoy the show today Dr. David Keane, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for the invitation to be here, Chris. I'm looking forward to our chat. Oh, me too, me too. And David, who are you in a nutshell? Okay. Well, you may have guessed my accent already that I'm originally Irish and I came to New Zealand 30, well, there you go, 32 years ago. (laughs) And I came from a little place called Middleton, which is in the south coast of Ireland. So I've been here in New Zealand and I've done a couple of excursions overseas as well for that time. I've married a Kiwi. My wife is Carmel. We've been married for 26 years this month. And we've got one daughter who's 22. So that's my sort of private life, I guess, in New Zealand. I'm an avid golfer. I really like golf or at least practicing it. And so from a business point of view, then I spent a lot of my time as an academic in various places. And then 12, 13 years ago, I created a company called 10 Behaviours of Successful People, which really taps into my passion, which is this whole subject of success, what drives success, and what we can learn from other successful people. So that's a little bit of a summary, Chris. Yeah, and with with the company and the work that you do, David, what was was the inspiration to start that? What was that on the back of? Well, for me, I've had a lifelong interest in the subject of success and, and what, what creates it. And maybe one of the things we're going to talk about in a little while is actually what do we mean by success, which I think is, is a really important question, especially these days. Um, so really for me, it was the desire to make a difference, to really do something that mattered. So as if when I look back in my life, Whenever that is, I'd say, well, you know, David, it was a good life. I did something that mattered. I made an impact and I used my skills as best I could. So the company then that we've created is called, as I said, the 10 Behaviours of Successful People. And we run workshops, seminars, coaching programs, small um, learning groups. But it's not just me in the company, which is probably what I'm most proud of, is that we've got a whole team of facilitators and coaches that are positioned all over the world as associates and they offer the program as, as part of their offering. So one of the things we do then is we actually accredit trainers, coaches, and consultants. And maybe somebody listening might be interested in this. You can get accredited in the 10 behaviors and then offer that to your clients. A lot of the ideas that I guess I've been working on for many years, they really got crystallized in my book, the 10 behaviors, the, the formal title of the book is called The Art of Deliberate Success, the subtitle, The 10 Behaviors of Successful People. And that identifies these 10 deliberate behaviors that successful people practically implement in their professional lives and in their personal lives. So that's a little bit about that, Chris, in terms of, you know, my passion for it. Honestly, I I wake up most days and I, it doesn't even feel like work for me. I'm really passionate about it and tremendous enjoyment from seeing other people flourish and thrive 
and become the best version of themselves, not just for themselves, but also for their organizations and their communities as well. So we're, we're focused on that. Nice. And, that, and that's been a, a really interesting theme of the leaders that I've talked to so far is that they, they're so passionate about it that they don't feel like it's work for mm. them, which is, yeah, which is interesting. I mean, even in these, these difficult times, these challenging times that we're going through at the moment, um, a lot of, like, there are a lot of people struggling. There are a lot of people finding it hard, but there are also a lot of people who are in the element at the moment as well, who are loving what is going on. And probably that's in part in terms of the skill set that they've brought to that, that area, but also some of these behaviors that they're putting into their own life as well to allow them to succeed at the moment. And I mean, there, there's no there's no real one size fits all for this kind of timing yeah. but what a i mean i know that you've been you've been watching you've been you've been seeing the stuff that's been going on what are some of the kind of the interesting themes that you're seeing at work at the moment okay well i'm, I'm really glad you said there chris that one size does not fit fit all i i think i'd really like to preface everything i'm going to talk about with that, because one of the things I've become acutely aware of is that some people are doing it really hard, you know? Mm. And I know we're gonna be talking about, you know, five things to be positive about, but some people out there, they find it really difficult to do that. You know, they may have lost a job, they might've lost their business, they might've been cooked up in a home with some young kids for a long time and might, you know, could be going on for a little further so sometimes i think it's dangerous for us to over prescribe what's right for every individual so over my coaching over the years i've become really aware that everybody started from a different place so and i suppose really when you think about the leadership if, for people who are listening that are leaders i think one of the, the most important things right now is to be really authentic and to be actually interested in people as individuals you know beyond the person who shows up at, at work. They've got real lives going on, and that is the backdrop or the context for the way they operate in their jobs or in their work. So I think one of the key things of a leader right now is to actually go that step to really, really understand what drives people, what actually matters now, and the reality of their lives. You know, the reality of their lives might be quite different from the person who shows up on a Zoom call. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think like context really matters at the moment. And that's kind of been hammered home to us that previously we could probably separate work and life a, a little bit and have it, have it nicely demarcated. But over the past six weeks, we haven't been able to do that, like work and life and, and everything is just one. It's in one spot. And whatever's going on in one part of a person's life is affecting, affecting the others. And, and that's, again, yeah, one of, the, one of the themes of the conversations that I've been having is that showing up and being interested and trying to understand the context of the people that you lead is really important, but also doing it your way as well, because you yes. have your own strengths and your own areas of speciality and the own, your own ways that you say things. So, I mean, for example, something that I would say to a team might be quite different to the way that you would get it across to them. Yeah, exactly. And it's understanding that context situation. I think one of the, the things that we're beginning to discover right now is that it's not really about work-life balance anymore. I think a much better term is work-life integration mm. you know and especially when people are rethinking entirely how they're actually working maybe the models of the past are not fitable anymore you know mm. yeah yeah that's a that's a massive rabbit hole that we could we could go down but i'm just going to steer us steer us around a little bit from that because like we, we've mentioned challenge, we've mentioned how difficult it is for people in this time. And, and I think everyone's experienced some level of difficulty, but there are, there's the opportunity for a lot of positive things to be going on as well. And we want to, we want to have a conversation about five of the positive things that you're seeing happening mm -hmm. at the moment and, and maybe how we can implement that into our own lives and into our own leadership. 
So what's, what, what's top of the list for you in terms of the, the positive stuff that's been happening over this time? Yeah, well, with the preamble, not, not everybody, not every size fits all. Here are the five, I guess, invitations to consider about being mm. positive is probably the way to put it. And so the first one I've identified here for us is this absolutely unique opportunity. I know we use the word unprecedented and that's probably overused, but it's actually mm. true. We've had this absolutely unique opportunity to press pause. That's the phrase I've got to describe it. And, you know, over the years of coaching with people, especially individuals can have an opportunity of pressing pause from time to time. You know, it can be the death of a family member. It could be a major shift in their employment status. It could be relationship issues. It could be a health issue and whatever, right? So from an individual's point of view, that opportunity can arise to press pause. Mm -hmm. But of course, what's happened right now is that we've all pressed pause at the same time. We, so it's, it's global. And so that then is quite a different characteristic because it's suddenly okay to have these incredibly honest conversations with people about what has been your answer for you when you press pause. And I think there's a, a few things around that, that, that I suppose we're invited to consider. And, and one of them is this big question, which I work on, which is the issue of what is success to you? What is success to you now? And mm. I think there's a possibility that once we've been pressing pause for the past number of weeks, some of the answers that are coming to us might be refreshing. There might be ideas that we didn't even know we had. And so maybe the track we've been on or success journey, if you like, is now coming under focus and you begin to question some of that. So the definition I use to define success, and I'm just going to be really clear with it because it's an important context issue. And that is that I would say that success is being on the pathway to the achievement of worthwhile dreams, whatever those dreams might be. So I'll just say that again, being successful is being on the pathway to the achievement of worthwhile dreams, whatever those dreams might be. So as you can see here, defining what success is to you is, is not a trivial matter, but mm -hmm. you'll notice that the definition I've just given has got nothing to do with money, power, fame, status, or even notoriety. It's all got to do with your alignment with what you consider important to you. And suddenly when we define success in that way, there's a panorama of possibilities that open up. And so that's what I think, you know, our first kind of area of focus is, is by pushing pause, we might get some answers back that we didn't even know were inside us. And, and that's a really exciting possibility. Mm. Yeah, and I really love the way that you have framed your definition of success there as well. It's, it's, it, it's not what maybe society tells us that it should be, or maybe not what we think society is telling us that it should be, that it is something that's unique to us and that we have the, the opportunity to explore further. And I think that like the, the push pause concept that you have used here is, is really interesting as well. And it's in kind of the way that I view that it's not a complete stop and a complete yeah. halt because like over the last, we, we were recording this just before we move into level two here in New Zealand. And over the last six and a half weeks, my schedule has been really full. Actually, I've had a lot of stuff that's been going on. So the, the pause for me has just been kind of breaking out of my usual routine and the, the usual busyness that I'm, I'm under and having a little bit more, maybe space is the wrong word, but having a little bit more wherewithal to be thinking about slightly different questions like how do I define success for me, for myself? Yeah, yeah it's interesting you talk about that spaciousness idea. So when you found that spaciousness in your life, what can you take from that moving forward, do you think, in practical terms? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. You've, you've flipped the switch on me here and in, in interviewing me, and I'm buying myself some time, as you can tell. <laughs> so I think, <laughs> think that's something that I'm still working on at the moment, that I, I, I don't know that I've come to a, a really great answer for myself with that, and I think it'll probably be something that evolves over time. but. I think at the moment is to continue to make sure that I'm 
asking myself yeah. interesting questions and how could I do this differently? How could I look at this from a different perspective? And then making sure that in some way I give myself, I give myself p permission, but I also give myself a little bit of time to be thinking about the answer and whether that I ask myself the question, then I go out for a run. So I have time to percolate on that. Or I ask myself a, a question and then I kind of sit down and do 10 minutes of, of journaling on it and just making, making sure that I incorporate some kind of practice like that into my day-to-day -day existence. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a, a really good approach because, you know, once you've been through this experience of pushing pause and as you, it's only pushing pause, it's not stop, right? It's mm. pushing pause. It's only temporary. There's a, a wonderful feeling that comes with that of spaciousness, as you've described it, or some people have talked about it around the terms of not being hurried in mm. the, as we are normally are, but isn't that a great memory to have to know that in this period of time, we know what it felt like to push pause and the value of that experience. So then when we go forward and we may, you know, forget some of these things, we still have the memory of it. We still have the memory of the feeling of what it was like to push pause and the goodness that that brought us, you know? So it's a unique opportunity, Chris, isn't it? Is to, to really think about what success is for us and to go beyond our superficial. Mm, definitely. And I think that's probably a nice segue. Like, what do you what do you think is is the next one on your list of the positive things that are happening right now? Well, associated with that, I guess like I guess the whole pressing pause thing is is the start. But as soon as we press pause, as you said, you've got the spaciousness, mm -hmm. and I think around that is this notion of simplification. What we're probably discovering is that our lives have got overly complex potentially. And it's a really refreshing thing to now look at what can I simplify here? So instead of just getting busy and being effective in that sense, it's a much better approach to look at what we're actually doing and perhaps simplify. I mean, it's probably simple things like, you know, the joy of, you know, going for a walk in a park with a child, you know, maybe that's real joy rather than necessarily going on an overseas holiday. You know, mm. it's, it's the discovery of joy in simplicity. And that's what I've really seen in the study of successful people over many years is that despite where they are in their organizations, they've got this desire for simplicity and to really get at things that matter and cut away things that don't matter as much. In fact, one of the books which I brought along here today, I'll just show you and we'll talk about some of the other things perhaps in a little while, is, is one of my favorite authors, Clayton Christensen. Now he is a professor at Harvard Business School. He just passed away this year, in fact, in January. He was only 67, but wow, what a great life he lived. But he wrote lots of books in leadership and strategy coming from the Harvard Business School. But this is his book that has had the most impact on people. It's called, How Will You Measure Your Life? And mm -hmm. one of the key messages in this book is got to do with simplification, is to look around our professional lives and our personal lives and ask these fundamental questions and to be open to the possibilities that the things that we've done in the past can be different. So I think that's sort of the, the, the kind of second one would be looking at these patterns that we might have developed and, and just questioning them and becoming more simplistic in our, in our view of things. And what do you see simplification giving us? Mm -hmm. Well, what simplification gives us, I believe, is a unique insight into what's truly important. As I said, over time, we develop these patterns and the patterns continue whether they're relevant or not, mm. you know? And what simplification does is that it, it forces us actually to, um, to, pr to, to, to just look around us and find out are things still necessary? Maybe they were once necessary, but not anymore. There's a wonderful story told about the American writer 
Henry David Thoreau. In 18, I think it was 1864, he wrote a book called On Walden Pond. And he spent two years, two months and two days in a little log cabin on the shores of Lake Massachusetts. And he came out of his cabin after all this, this time and wrote a letter to his friend Emerson, who lived on the same area. And he said to Emerson in his little letter, oh, look, I've spent two years, two months and two days reflecting on success. And the answer is simplify, simplify, simplify. The story goes that Emerson wrote a letter back saying, were those two extra simplifies really necessary? <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice, nice. So it, it, it's kind of almost like you're, you're trimming a hedge as well, is that you're, you're trimming off the, the parts that you don't need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you are. And, and, but the interesting thing is, in order to trim the hedge, if you like, you need to know what view is important to you. In other words, what mm. we've just been talking about. So if we don't have a good concept of success, it is actually impossible to simplify. Yeah. Yep. There's no measurement possibility against that. Mm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And David, what's the, what's the third thing that you, the third positive thing that's happening right now? Well, if there was going to be a pandemic, this is probably one of the best times ever to have one in terms of the access that we have to information and to knowledge. And I've often been reflecting on what it was like for people back in 1918 with the Spanish flu back then. Mm. It must have been absolutely horrendous. The fear factor, the uncertainty, the health issues and so on, right? But I think one of the unique things that we, we have right now in this time is we've got access to all this information that is really useful to help us to go forward. So I don't know about you, and again, not one size fits all here, but some people I know have had time to reflect, you know, and to actually do some reading perhaps, look at some Netflix things that are educational or challenging, or they might be sources of information that are challenging, you know, to question or, or beliefs on, on many things. I think there's a whole rediscovery of the arts and the appreciation of that. What else have we got? We've actually, I was talking to somebody recently and they were saying to me that one of the key things that they've reflected on in this time is actually their relationships. Mm -hmm. And they were asking, it's been really interesting to see who's called me, who I've reached out to, and who is my network that I really trust. So it's going to be interesting to know that going forward, you know, are we going to be more discerning in relationships and let's call it professional associations and contacts. Okay. So again, we're, we're caused, I think, to do this reflection. And of course, part of the reflection is that there are some ideas that are just gone past our use by date. Like, for example, the idea of remote work. Well, even just two months ago, that would have not been a possibility for many people and organizations. And now we're seeing the opposite. People don't necessarily want to go back to a physical office because they've enjoyed it so much or they've got more done or they've got other benefits that were unanticipated. So again, what's been happening here, Chris, I think is we've been challenged to relook at beliefs that are just gone past our use by date. So that's one area, this whole issue of where work needs to get done and how much of it. I think another interesting thing will become remote will become normal mm. and face to face will start becoming the exception potentially. That's going to be interesting. And I suppose for other people as well, again, depending on your situation, I know that with simplicity coming into play, maybe or need for financial resources um, has been come into question. You know, maybe we, we can live much simpler and less demandingly on our finances. Maybe we don't need a lot of stuff that we thought we did. You mm. know? So I think this time for reflection then as, as an idea has been really positive because we, our mind has gone off in all sorts of directions that we wouldn't normally, normally get the opportunity to do. And as I said, because everybody's doing it, it's okay. It's yep. normal. It's normal to ask these more profound questions now. But isn't that wonderful? It is. It is good. And it's, I think it's kind of created a sense of safety for people to be able to do that and to be able to question a little bit more because there's a lot more visibility around this, this questioning process at the moment, because as you said, everyone is doing it. And there's a lot of people 
who are writing about it and and posting videos and things about it as well whereas previously it maybe maybe it wasn't seen as so normal yeah it was a solo effort you know mm. yeah yeah or it happened it happened in isolation and and no one really talked about it yeah it happened in counseling rooms and behind closed <laughs> doors chris right yeah yeah and then that so so now you know people can can i think for example they could say well maybe the job i've been doing for these x number of years maybe not maybe this is my one opportunity to do something that really I, i'm excited by something i'm passionate about maybe it's an opportunity to switch do something different wow it's just wonderful if that's the mindset that we can take on yeah and i think that that kind of segues nicely into the next thing that you you were going to talk about in terms of your focus and where where you place your focus mm -hmm. yeah it's been interesting i guess talking to people over the past number of weeks in terms of how what they've learned is that because of their condensed time availability they've just had to focus really quickly you know on things i love the old 80 20 rule you know that 80 mm. percent of the benefits in any endeavor comes from 20 percent of the effort so isn't it really good to be able to look from time to time and say well what is my 20 percent of things that really produce the results and i think we've been forced to do that like i was talking to somebody recently and their practical challenge was that there was two parents at home, both people worked and they had three young kids and the, the number one resource in their home was their kitchen table. It's, and they had to in, invent a booking system. <laughs> so it was that, you know, one time, you know, one person would take the kids out and the other time, you know, the other person would work and so on. So they had to almost create a little roster mm. for work. And so therefore, when we're now sitting down to work, for example, if it's a stretch of, say, a two hour window of time to work on something, we become incredibly focused, knowing that we've got two hours, whereas probably in the past, we might have said things like, oh, OK, I'll kind of cruise around and then maybe they're at night time or in the weekend or whatever. But now because of the physical and dimensions of what we're dealing with, maybe we're invited, if you like, to become much more focused in what we're doing. And that, of course, looks at how we work. Some of the, the, the rules that we have about the, the doing of work might be challenged as well. So mm. now, there's a lot of possibility in that. Actually, I've got another book for you here, Chris. It's one of my favorite books by Gary Keller. It's called The One Thing. Yes. Um, you might have come across that book yourself in your Dig, reading. Digby Scott, had, he held that one up on his episode as well, I think. Did he? Okay. He did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, that is one of those books where you think, actually, there's a lot in this and how do I practically implement it is a great question. Mm. And uh, one, one thing that I want to dig into a little bit more there, David, is that the how of work. What do you mean by the how of work? What I mean by the how of work is that over time, we develop certain habits of how we do things. Mm. And even organizations do this, right? They've got procedures, they've got steps involved in processes, for example. And that's fine. And I'm sure there's good thinking behind that. But the invitation is, is that under changed circumstances, are those steps really relevant? Mm. Maybe not. I had a conversation recently with somebody and they were saying that one of the things I've discovered is that there's much less red tape in terms of procedures. Yeah. Now I'm not saying red tape is a bad thing. It's a, it's a safeguard and it's definitely important, but it's just questioning this idea of the sequence of the old ideas we have about the way we do things. Maybe we come to the same conclusion that you might say, actually, what we've been doing in the past is quite good. Let's stick with that maybe not too, you know, mm. maybe it's an invitation for us to question the sequencing and how we go about things. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for clarifying that. And the, the final point, David, what's the, what's the final positive thing happening at the moment that you, that you see? All right then. Well, this is actually probably my favorite one, in fact, and this is this whole notion of we've been invited into an opportunity to do an information audit. Okay, now what do we mean by that? Well, what's probably happened in the past number of weeks is that we've become absolutely bombarded by information coming at us from all angles. The intensity of 
social media has got very high. We've got all sorts of things on news. We've got this huge potential, or, or as one writer put it, information anxiety possibility, mm. information anxiety. We've just been overawed by too much information or more precisely too much data, not information, because inf information is data laced with meaning. But a lot mm. of what we have right now is just data being dumped upon us. So I think one of the interesting things to be considered here is potentially looking at our informational world and doing, let's call it an, an information audit. Yeah. And just sort of check out, one of my favorite words around this is the word veracity. Veracity means truthfulness. So it's being able to look at the information in our world that's positioned all around us and be able to become more discerning about it and saying, do I really believe that? This information that's been presented to me, why is it being presented in that way? Does the person presenting of it, present this information, have a particular context that they're coming from? Do they have an underlying agenda, for example, from what they're coming from? And is what's being presented to me in the way it's being presented relevant from my context right now? So I think part of what will happen is that we'll become much more discerning about curating our informational world. And, and I think the main reason that I, I'm, I'm ex excited about this possibility is that the information that we allow ourselves to be exposed to has a m big impact on our mood. I don't know, have you had this kind of thing where you start off in the early morning and you think, oh, I'm full of beans, I'm ready to go and attack the world and everything is looking fantastic. And then suddenly you get a, a text or an email or something and it's potentially, you know, bad news or, you know, and you think, oh, okay, maybe my enthusiasm for the day has been somewhat lost. It can also op op operate on the opposite. And that is that you could have an email or a text or something that's incredibly positive. And you're so exuberant that what you were going to do today is like, nah, I won't bother with that now. <laughs> <laughs> so what we have then is, and, and, and I, I think we'd all appreciate that the, the choices we make about our exposure to information has a really impactful consequence on our mood and therefore our performance during that day. So again, what the invitation then is all about is to broaden perspective, to become much more of a curator of information, to be more questioning and not taking things at face value. Mm, yeah, and I, I agree with that. And I've, I've been trying to put that in, into my practice a little bit as well over this time period is like what information actually do I need to be consuming at the moment? Like, because yeah. as we talked about, there's so much out there. There's, there's so much information that you have the potential to consume. So applying the filter to what is important to bring into my world at the moment, and then kind of questioning the, I like that word as well, the veracity of it. Yes. yes. Um, and, and again, sorry, Chris, go ahead. Uh, and, and kind of how do I, how, how do I apply it into my context? Exactly. Because information is just out there. It's kind of agnostic, if you like. Mm. It's just sitting there, but it may not be relevant to your context. But of course, the interesting thing is this judgment as what's relevant to my context brings us all back to point number one, which is, is what pushing pause and asking this more profound question, which is what's success to me. So once we can work out that answer, the informational question becomes much easier to answer. Mm. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And David, this is, this is all about improving our leadership skills and how do we become better leaders. But has there been a time in, you, in your life where you feel that you haven't led particularly well? And if so, are you happy to share that? Yeah, but I haven't led well. Yeah. Yeah, I had one situation in my life where I was under extreme stress and anxiety. It was just a unique set of circumstances. And what I let go was my self care. Mm. And, you know, I was so focused on the immediate that that's all I saw. I lost perspective, if you like. So, this notion of 
as one writer puts it, extreme self-care. I think when we lose that point of view, we're in danger from a leadership point of view. So what I'd say to leaders is that to become a great leader, become a great leader of yourself first and foremost. You know, it begins at home. Or as Stephen Covey, the great writer, put it, success is an inside job, you know. And um, so I think it's a really good thing to be able to look at our lives and saying things like, you know, am I taking good self-care myself? To use Digby's word, am I being curious? Am I being curious? Or am I down in the engine room doing, doing, doing? but having lost perspective. And I think that that for me is probably one of the key things is to know that you're taking good care of yourself, but not in a selfish way. It's in a, a proper way so that you can be of service. It's all about being of service, but you can only be of service if you're taking good care of yourself first. So that's why I'm a real believer in people having an ongoing journey of being curious, about reading, listening to podcasts like yours, you know, Uncomfortable is okay. It's a wonderful is is a wonderful podcast because it shows people going through challenging times. And what better way for somebody to become inspired by looking at other people and what they've done and finding out what they can learn from that and apply within their own professional lives and in their personal lives as well. I think as we talked about earlier, it's a question of having this work life integration and seeing yourself as a holistic, authentic person. People like that, they're of tremendous value to their organizations. And I think that's the kind of talent that organizations in future is gonna actively seek out and want to have on board. Mm -hmm. And David, with that stuff in mind, what should leaders be doing right now? Right now, I think listening, it's probably my number one thing I'd suggest that they do. So that they're really listening to see what is it that really drives people and what is it that matters to people most right now. And if that job is done well, action will occur, but it will be the right action to occur. So I don't have a big list of things to do right now, but I think the number one thing is to just listen really well and if you listen really well, what to do next becomes obvious. Mm, I completely agree with that. David, if people want to connect with you, where's the best place for them to do that? All right, then. Well, there's a number of different possibilities depending on how you want to connect with me. So for some people listening, they might want to attend a program, one of our 10 behaviors programs. It could be anywhere in the world. We've got partners that offer programs in multiple places. So if you get onto the website and you go to the events section, they can book onto public programs. So that's one possibility. If you're a leader or you're a people manager or you're responsible for a team of people that you would like to take your team on the journey of the 10 behaviors, we can definitely talk to you about that. Again, that's a question of contacting us on the website and letting us know about that. And then the third possibility would be if you're a coach, a trainer, or a consultant, you might be sitting there and thinking, I'd really like to make the 10 behaviors available to my clients, in which case we can actually credit you to actually deliver the program. Now, one of the things we've recently developed has been a live stream edition of the 10 behaviors. So it can be delivered remotely and the accreditation as well can be delivered remotely. So we can be up and running within a week for somebody that wants to get accredited. So there are the kind of three possibilities, Chris, there with the the website then is 10behaviors.com or on LinkedIn. We've got some interesting material on there as well that might be of interest to people. Fantastic. Dr. David Keane, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Chris. Really enjoyed our chat. Thank you. Thank you so much for getting uncomfortable with us today. I always love these conversations. If you want to hear a guest, if you want to have a topic explored, if you want to ask a question, please send an email to chris at healthmentors.nz uh, and we can get onto that for you. If you want to support the show, the best way that you can do that is subscribe on your favorite podcast app and make sure to share it out with some of your mates as well. Thank you to Health Mentors, the sponsor of the show today. If you want to improve your health, 
and your performance in the middle of a chaotic world, make sure to check out healthmentors.nz or send an email to chris at healthmentors.nz for a no-obligation chat. Thank you so much to my brother Jeremy Desmond for the amazing theme music to the show. Thank you to you guys for tuning in and listening all the way to the end. We'll see you all again next week.